welcome back. Now we turn our attention to the critical issue of the imbalances in the global political economy laid bare by the recent COVID pandemic. This esteemed panel asks and answers the question, what are the systemic macroeconomic challenges in each region of the world? Our wonderful moderator, Aishu Balaji of Regions Refocus, helps this panel explore the analysis and find answers to these questions. Over to you, Aishu. Hello, I'm excited to welcome you to this panel on imbalances in the global political economy on day two of the inaugural Gender and Development Forum. A big thank you to our hosts and organizers at the University of the West Indies in Barbados, led by the incredible Professor Eudine Barato and Dr. Tanya Haynes. I'm Aishu Balaji from Regions Refocus, which is a co-chair of the Gender and Trade Coalition and a member of the Gender and Development Forum Consultative Committee. From the Philippines, we have Joan May Salvador, who is at the Gabriella Alliance of Filipino Women and the Asia Pacific Forum on Women, Law and Development. She will discuss finance and investment. From Argentina, we have Corina Rodriguez Enriquez from Development Alternatives with Women for a New Era, who will discuss COVID-19 and the systemic economic issues it's revealed. And from Guyana, we have Vanda Radzik, the co-founder of Red Thread, who will discuss the care economy. We'll kick off with Joan first. So thank you, Aishu, and good day, everyone. And I thank the organizers for this occasion to speak. I have been asked to speak on systemic macroeconomic challenges related to finance and investments, specifically about imbalances in the global political economy as it holds true for the Asia Pacific region. So let me begin by saying that for all it's worth, let us all be reminded that the matter of global trade and investments is a political issue as much as it is an issue of women and gender. Our current global economic system and the ways with which we as peoples from our own regions, from our own countries, from our own communities, navigate this global economy and live and survive as human beings, as women, came about as a result of geopolitical forces. Who gets what, when, and how much is as much a matter of political decisions as they were by economic choices. So at this point, I'll say that our current global economic system as a battleground is a battleground for competing interests. And always who wins or loses in this battle is determined by who wins in the struggle for power and influence. And from here, maybe let me talk about the Asia-Pacific region and its place in the geopolitics. As we all may be aware, Asia-Pacific share in global foreign direct investments inflows. Um, there is a current um, trend of a downward trend, inflows dropping um, from 45% in 2018 to 35% in 2019, and even more so today or now as uh, we are uh, we find ourselves right smack in the middle of a global pandemic and uh, the resulting economic crisis but nonetheless the region remains the largest source of global outflows even as it is today during the pandemic but at the same time the asia pacific region is a street strategic battleground in the struggles for power and uh, regionally, it is now called as a U.S.-China rivalry for competing markets and influence in many of the economies in the Asia-Pacific region. And as such, there is a rising militarization and economic capture by uh, many of the world's power over the economy of the Asia-Pacific region. But at the same time, um, the whole politics and the relationships between and among uh, the bigger uh, economies of the global north and the global south are um, um, influenced and uh, driven by the neoliberal globalization project. And after more than three decades of it, it has been increasingly acknowledged that austerity, privatization, the regulation of finance markets and corporations, and trade and investment liberalization, which are cornerstones of neoliberal globalization, have had a devastating and discriminatory impact on women. Neoliberalism has a discriminatory and adverse impact on uh, the world's women, 
and it is simply incapable of supporting gender equitable and just sustainable development. So globally, at the same time, there are more than 3,000 bilateral and multilateral agreements that govern global trade and investment. And of course, recent large multilateral agreements such as the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership and the CPPPP have sought to expand the scope of agreements to provide for global governance over an increasing number of economic issues outside of the UN and World Trade Organization systems. But these trade agreements, designed primarily to enable unhindered flow of global capital, are a significant barrier to the realization of the human rights of women. So, well, and some advocates would even argue that trade agreements are designed to reduce barriers to trade and level the playing field by ensuring foreign investors are not negatively impacted by national laws or regulations that preference locals or that impact on foreign investors. In reality, however, trade agreements are designed for and by large multinational corporations who are able to displace smaller local businesses and who use their political power to gain significant advantages. And while trade agreements may provide benefits to people who have the capacity to capitalize on new market opportunities and workers classified as highly skilled, however, as women are less likely to hold large amounts of capital, are most commonly engaged in the informal sector, are less likely to have secure land rights, and are more likely to benefit from public expenditure in health, education, water, energy. Trade agreements have a discriminatory effects. And in addition, trade agreements expose a large majority of the global population to violations of their human rights. And in fact, I would like to recall a 2015 um, statement made uh, by the Human Rights Council mandate holders who voiced their concerns over the impact of trade and investment agreements on human rights jointly as well as in their separate reports. And the collective statement, of course, warned the trade agreements are likely to have a number of retrogressive effects on the protection and promotion of human rights, including by lowering the threshold of health protection, food safety, and labor standards by catering to the business interests of, of pharmaceutical monopolies and extending intellectual property protection, which I think, I think now that we are in the middle of this pandemic rings also true uh, in our current uh, context and situations. And as such, um, there is now a race to the bottom with women, unfortunately, at the bottom. Neoliberalism promotes labor competition, but does not protect labor rights. And of course, trade agreements such as the WTO, RCEP, are designed to facilitate greater market competition and freer flow of global capital, enabling increased access to resources and cheap labor in signatory countries. The promotion of exported, export-oriented economies rather than the promotion of domestically focused economies Nearly two-thirds of women in Asia-Pacific, therefore, work in vulnerable employment, lacking basic security, benefits, and decent working conditions. Women also comprise an increasing percentage of workers in export industries, and they are most likely to experience the downward pressure on wages, work conditions, and rights. It is also evident that the current pandemic has exacerbated many, existing negative, of many of these existing negative trends from rising income inequalities to what is now, uh, as many call, a gaping digital divide. COVID-19 has laid bare pre-existing weaknesses in governance and social protection provisions in Asia and as much as globally. And alarmingly, the pandemic and the current economic crisis lays bare the disproportionate impact of the pandemic on the livelihoods of millions of informal employment who have, been, who have become newly unemployed or underemployed. And the pandemic has highlighted what many of us already know, the weak foundations of Asian labor systems, restrictions on the movement of peoples and the sudden stoppage of severe or severe downscaling of economic activities. And the sudden, uh, uh, to contain, of course, the spread of the virus are having a strong impact on informal workers and also even among uh, informal workers. But again, the sectors worst affected by the pandemic, such as accommodation and food service activities, including tourism, wholesale and retail trade, transportation, construction, all have a particularly high proportion of informal labor. And may I just note that about 70% of those belonging to the informal labor are women. 
So, the, um, as we have said, as I have said, the COVID-19 pandemic has accelerated the downward trend already recorded in recent years in the Asian economy as a whole. And it has laid bare the gaping divide and uh, extreme social inequities that the current neoliberal system uh, provides for us. And uh, at the throes of this pandemic and this crisis, countries are racing to secure foreign direct investments. And in the Asia Pacific region, the US and China are um, playing up and are securing more and more power and influence over um, strategic investment opportunities in many of the uh, Asian economies affected by the current crisis. But apart from infrastructure investments, military aid, Vaccine trade is also an emerging issue in the geopolitics of investments in the Asia-Pacific region with China, uh, of course, um, securing many bilateral uh, vaccine trade arrangements with many um, countries and economies in the Asia-Pacific region in exchange, of course, for greater leeway to secure uh, foreign direct investments in these countries. But of course, the question is at, at what cost? more becoming unemployed, more becoming poor, more being robbed of their access to decent work and decent wages, widening and deepening inequalities. So to end, I let me just say that there has to be, and I, in, in the face of all the uncertainties that the current situation brings us, there has to be a better solution to the crisis we are all in. And many of the peoples of Asia and other underdeveloped countries have known misery and desperation like the back of their hands. The system has failed them, has failed us. We all need to work towards a more equitable, more just, and more humane development strategy. An economic system that does not put corporations or the powerful few, even richer and powerful, while majority of the world's peoples race to the deeper bottom. So thank you, and may we all work towards the dawn of true development for all. Thanks, Jen. Karina? Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and, and to share this space with the colleagues. I will focus my presentation on, on reflecting about how the COVID crisis uh, faced new challenges to systemic uh, challenges. Uh, and the first thing I want to say is that we, we can understand this COVID context as a mirror of systemic issues. Uh, and and I, I would like to mention three of, or four of them. Uh, something that this crisis made very clear is the vulnerability of life and how essential care is. Uh, something that feminists have been said for long, uh, the COVID crisis made it very, very clear. Uh, care work, care for everyday lives is essential and should be at the center of the economic and, and social organization. The other issue that this context made it very clear uh, is the, the, the heavy, uh, the, the, the heavy feature of inequalities, both between countries and within countries. Uh, we have faced uh, very unequal conditions to, to face the, the health crisis, very unequal conditions to avoid being infected by the virus, uh, very different conditions to be able to support living conditions during periods of restrictions that limited economic activities. Uh, the situation has been very different for formal workers than for informal workers, than for people who mainly do unpaid care work. Uh, we have faced uh, inequalities to access to health care. Um, and something that the, the pandemic also made it very clear is the key role of public policy. Uh, and it has also mirrored the impact that long stand uh, processes of marketization and privatization of social provisioning has uh, made. And it, it has also uh, shown the implications of the corporate capture of social provisioning, the, the impact of 
a private interest governing the provision of health, the provision of basic social services. Uh, and it has also shown, thinking about the space for public policies, the impact of these uh, structural adjustment policies that in the South, many countries have faced, faced for, for many years and even decades. Uh, but I think that the pandemic also showed that uh, there is a possibility to challenge the mantra of austerity uh, because many countries, both in the North and in the South, have uh, invested resources to face the, the, the crisis. So I think it has been made clear that when there is political will, we can face the austerity mantra, we can use uh, heterodox uh, um, ways of financing uh, public policies. But of course, uh, the, the policy space in the, between countries have been very different. And there is also a question about at what cost, at what cost countries were able to implement public policies uh, to, to face the, the crisis. So I think the context have added new challenges to the, the, the usual systemic issues. I think there are new challenges for a global economic dynamic, for, for global trade, uh, I think there are uh, new challenges uh, that bring new questions about migration trends and, and migration uh, is, is, is key uh, when we uh, understand global value chains, but also when we understand global care changes. Change. Um, and I think there are new challenges for the economic recovery that we are expecting after this, this crisis. There are countries uh, where uh, their main economic activities uh, may still remain very challenged with the new situations, countries that base their economy very much on tourism, for example. Uh, and I think there is something that has become very clear and can be understood as a, an example of systemic issues. That is the, the whole issue of access to, to vaccines, uh, that we can think about it in a broader way uh, on access to medicine. I think uh, what is happening with the distribution of vaccines in the world is a clear example of uh, something that I don't we mention as the fierce new world. Uh, and it also uh, shown the limits of multilateralism, the, the, the project of the COVAX mechanism to distribute vaccines to to poorer countries has failed. Uh, and also something that Joan already mentioned, that this whole horrible idea of the geopolitical battles over people's lives, over people's access to, to healthcare and to, and to uh, vaccines. So I, I think this, this context uh, and these new challenges brought by the crisis uh, make systemic transformation more urgent than ever, but also more difficult. And, and I think that when talking about the future, uh, when talking about the needed systemic transformation, uh, we should ask whether what we are expecting is a gender equality recovery, a, a gender sensitive recovery, or rather we want to push for a feminist transformation. I, and I would very much push for, for the later. And, and I think is if we are pushing for a feminist transformation after this crisis, we need to, to think about how to build a, not only a care economy, but a care society. Uh, we need to put care at the center. We need to, pull, to put people over profit. And, and this is a very radical and systemic uh, transformation. We need to challenge the, the growth model because also we have just uh, read about the um, the climate change uh, report and this is also very urgent to challenge the the model of production the model of consumption the growth model that uh, lead uh, economic uh, dynamics uh, and for that i think we need much more global coordination uh, we need a global response to the debt crisis uh, we need a global coordination uh, to regulate those who have gained a lot with the crisis, for example, the, the big fintech. Uh, we need to push uh, coordinating it globally for 
uh, global tax structures on corporations, on wealth. Uh, we need to finally push for uh, transforming the global finance and architecture and, of course, the global regulatory institutions as the uh, WTO, but also the state and investment dispute, uh, dispute settlement uh, mechanism. Uh, I think there is a big call to, to challenge uh, the access to medicine, and I, I would like to call the attention for the uh, Feminist for, for People's Vaccine campaign. You can Google it and, and see the actions that we are taking in this, in this field. And I think it's time also to, to globally coordinate in order to assure that every country can build uh, social protection floors that can guarantee basic living conditions in terms of access, access to income, but also access to, to basic uh, social services. And, and for this, and I will finish here, uh, I think global organizing and mobilizing is, uh, is key. Uh, we can only push this feminist transformative agenda if we work together, if we, uh, if we discuss what are our common uh, values and we push for them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Corina. Wanda? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can yes. hear you. Okay, so thank you, Professor Udine, Dr. Tonya, our host, Marsha, moderator, Aishu, and uh, my sister panelists for the opportunity to participate in this historic UNCTAD conference. So uh, my topic is the care economy. Well, there's no country in which the unequal access to resources has not been exposed and where women have not been impacted by the collapse of financial systems. We live in a world where women's unpaid labor underpins the entire world economy. We in the Caribbean have suffered 500 years and more of colonization, enslavement, indentureship, racism, and sexism, all anchored in capitalism, and now it's new face and language, free trade, globalization, neoliberalization, all of which means exploitation. COVID has exposed the, the very ugly underbelly of this beast. Women, we know this reality as over the centuries, the fight for equality has staggered under the inherently unequal burdens of patriarchy, privilege, greed, and growth. The literature is exhaustive on the failure of the old capitalist growth model that assumes the free services of nature and all of her assets, as well as the free labor of women. That assumes that her caring work, household labor, and the upbringing of the next generation are also free goods and services. Care work is defined broadly as work and relationships that are necessary for the health, welfare, maintenance, and protection of all people, of all genders, young and old, able-bodied, disabled, and frail. Care, at its very core, is a basic human need and a necessity. And whether we know it or not, we all participate in providing care work, paid or unpaid, and in receiving care every day. It provisions nurturing, it sustains life. Unpaid, unpaid care work is not included in our national GDP because GDP only takes into account work that is done for pay in the formal market. Therefore, if we only look at the GDP as an economic measure, we miss a huge segment of the economy and the economic case is already plain as day. The monetary value of women's unpaid care work globally, ages 15 and over, is estimated at $10.8 trillion annually. Feminist academics and feminist economists have been flagging this issue from many corners of the planet for years. The care economy costs women, and it's time, high time, to pay up. Kachingui asks the important question of how the overall care economy is being engineered for the extraction of profits. It is a hard question that needs to be asked and answered. She argues against the system simply 
refining the gendered safety net we already have, which keeps women in the home and out of the workforce. Are we just getting into systems that make this more palatable? Or are we looking at a complete overhaul of the macroeconomic fundamentals? Because clearly, the short-term COVID-19 fiscal stimulus and relief packages have largely failed to address unpaid work, including childcare. Well, you know, economists love infrastructure, <laughs> such as roads, bridges, telecommunications. They're considered durable, visible, and yielding returns into the future. However, investment in social infrastructure or essential infrastructure, the care sector, also yields returns to the economy and society well into the future in the form of a better educated, healthier, and better cared for population. Oxfam International reports that in 2020 alone, waged women globally lost more than 64 million jobs, costing women $800 billion in earnings, equivalent to more than the combined GDP of 98 countries. Yet, even this conservative estimate doesn't include the millions of women working in the informal economy, domestic workers, market vendors, garment workers, etc. And it does not count the unpaid caregiving work by women, which has exploded in every country on every continent. COVID-19 is a crisis with a woman's face, said the UN Secretary General in his opening remarks at the Commission on the Status of Women 65th Conference in March this year. Additionally, the economic cost to the global economy of violence against women and sexual harassment in the, worst, in the workplace is estimated at $12 trillion annually. And the shadow epidemic during COVID has only accelerated these crimes. Women bear the brunt of coping with climate-related shocks as well and stresses on the health effects of indoor, outdoor, and urban pollution, adding to their care burden. As land, forest, and water resources are increasingly compromised, privatized, or grabbed for commercial investment, local communities and indigenous peoples, particularly women whose livelihoods depend on them, are marginalized and displaced. So I, show an, I have some conclusions and recommendations, and I'd like to begin by invoking a Caribbean feminist statement um, in the time of COVID, May 31st last year, titled Organizing to Live. It was dedicated to the late Guyanese activist Kandaye, and it says in part, we must not return to the business as usual model of Caribbean economic development that is fundamentally extractive, exploitative, outward oriented, and characterized by poverty, socioeconomic and gender inequalities, and ecologically destructive, making us all more vulnerable than ever before in this Caribbean. It is time to draw lessons from the strengths and achievements of our region. We do best when we take care of each other, when we express our culture, when we support creativity, and when we honor our rebellious history, refusing to be complacent about inequalities. And my other concluding thoughts and recommendations, and I'm sort of targeting these at UNCTAD and its sphere. So, quoting from the policy tool of March 2021 by the UN Women and the ILO on investments in the care economy, I've made a recommendation one, where you put your money matters. Some macroeconomists, including feminists, have increasingly emphasized that where you spend makes a huge difference. They are critical of the human and gender bias in classifying only capital and physical inf infrastructure as investment expenditures. They make the case for spending on labor intensive service sectors, such as health, and education, and for social goals such as gender, inclusive growth, 
and enhanced human capital. Recommendation to UNCTAD. Put your own good words into action, please and pronto. The UNCTAD 2017 background note says, given the employment challenges associated with structural and technological change and women's primary responsibility for both paid and unpaid care work, transforming care activities into decent work should become an integral part of strategies aimed at building more inclusive economies. <clears throat> Therefore, please consider one, a gender sensitive approach, including bolder gender budgeting to effectively address gender gaps in the labor market that is so intertwined with the unequal distribution of the care burden. Two, reallocate resources towards a social care infrastructure. Three, be proactive in breaking the vicious cycle of the current unsustainable and earth destroying growth models and move towards a virtuous cycle of inclusive care-based growth with investments in meeting multiple SDGs underpinned by the two most cross-cutting of all, Women's Empowerment and Gender Equality, Goal 5, and Climate Action, Goal 13. Four, we must not go back to normal. Normal does not work for all workers, especially women and people of color. We now know it will take 135.6 years to reach gender parity. Five, are we collectively and UNCTAD specifically, are we all intentional about closing the gender gap of having unpaid care work valued and paid for? and using the crisis to fix what is, what was wrong with the system? If yes, and if so, we need to be radical in the best sense of that root word and to listen to the words of the poet of my country when he says, what the leaves hear is not what the roots ask. I end with the words of Andai from her profoundly named book, the point is to change the world. She writes, growing poverty <clears throat> and inequality increase the time and labor that mainly women have to spend in trying to avoid catastrophes for their families. This is why globally, the rising movement against an uncaring market is being led by women in small and large actions. She quotes from the Women's Manifesto of the Housewives of Argentina, in January of 2002, which called for a wage and pension for caring work, benefits for each child, refunding of small savers deposits, debt relief for small farmers, employment plans to undergo a social audit by women. And are these not all as needed and relevant and brilliant today? in 2021 for our world and our change? The Housewives Manifesto concludes, our power is our autonomy. We will not allow anyone to tell us what to think or do. We know our needs, our lived realities and those of our families. And therefore we will find the ways to build a country and a world which starts from people's needs rather than corporate greed. So what's required, my sisters and all of us in this um, historic conference today, what's required is, of course, transformative resolve and action. Because after all, as Andaye proclaims, the point is to change the world. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vanda. And thank you so much to all of the panelists. Uh, before we open the floor for questions from the audience, one question I want to ask you is how can UNCTAD's mandate and their program of work reflect the concerns you're raising and what measures can member states take? Um, so this is something that all of the panelists have touched on, but I'm curious about whether you have any further thoughts on this. Uh, we can start with Joan again. Thank you, Aishu. 
So supposedly included in UNCTAD's mandate is the is his commitment to gender equality as a development goal and objective, and that means integrating integrating gender considerations in trade policy formulation and implementation. And uh, in this situation of crisis, UNCTAD has been talking about how, for example, uh, the influx of foreign direct investments, while probably not portfolio investments, but greenfield investment may be the key to keep us you know, all afloat and you know, survive the crisis. But unfortunately, I would have to, um, to, to disagree because I think FDIs, whether portfolio or greenfield or brownfield investment, will not make for sustainable development so long as uh, inequality of wealth among countries exists. So long as um, wealth and resources are siphoned from underdeveloped and developing countries or economies towards the more developed capitalist economies, and so long as people's um, the, the the wealth and resources um, are siphoned from peoples of the world towards corporations and elites, there is no real development if the system continues also to perpetuate gender inequalities and does not guarantee human rights of all, especially including women who have historically uh, borne the face of inequality, poverty, and uh, economic misery. So I guess um, there is, as, as many as, as, as the other speakers have spoken, there is a need for a radical shift in development model. And uh, at this point, I think um, the, the current crisis and pandemic we're in comes knocking at us that if there is any best time to have that radical shift, it is now. Uh, we have stared misery so much for the past years. And I think uh, many of the world's people, especially the poor, cannot take it anymore. And um, there is for APWLD, for example, we have a model of and a demand for transform transformative shifts uh, through a development justice uh, framework that uh, aims to reduce inequalities of wealth, power, and resources between countries, between rich and poor, between men and women, and also taking into consideration at the center of it greater accountability of governments um, to peoples. It cannot be, you know, states that are virtually appendages of um, uh, the, the, the persuasions and interests of corporations, especially so big uh, corporations. Mm -hmm. It has to be states or governments that uh, primarily stand for the interests and for human rights of all, including and especially so among women who comprise the most marginalized in any and all uh, region um, of the world. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Joan. Uh, Corina? Well, I, I, I could ask all members of UNCTAN to attend this Gender and Development Forum and to listen to us seriously. Uh, and, and I think what should push their, uh, their work plan should be what we are talking about here. People over profit, care over over corporations uh, benefits. Uh, from the feminist field, we have been uh, making lots of proposals. Some of them have been already exposed uh, here. Um, and, and I think that that is the, the, the way to go. As, as we have already said, uh, we shouldn't go back to, to normal. Uh, and and it's, a, it's not a matter of, you know, just uh, uh, Attending gender gaps is a matter of transforming uh, uh, the system. Uh, and for that, these values, care, people's life, human rights should be what uh, should lead uh, policies at the national level and what should lead, lead uh, coordination at this kind of multilateral spaces. Thank you. Thank you, Corina. Vanda, do you have any further thoughts? And I think that uh, uh, Joan and Corina have covered a lot of ground. I think that, um, yes, I mean, I'm disgusted with, with I, I'm so disgusted with capitalism and that we haven't, we humans with all our brilliance, haven't seemed to come up with anything, you know, that is, 
that would really be very different. But I think we do have the solutions. And I think that in so long as we have this deepening, deepening, unequal world within our own countries, where the rich are richer and the poor are poorer, and then within the world at large, we're kind of doomed. I, I am, you know, uh, the other trend in my life is the environment. And I am, I am so concerned about um, what is happening the world over. So scientists and everybody, and, and we women know it, this fossil fuel nonsense, <laughs> A, it has to stop. And yet, for instance, in my country, Guyana, we are now being very poor. We are now being touted as the Saudi Arabia of the Caribbean, because as soon as you look at our offshore ocean, oil springs up. And we have the rogues like ExxonMobil um, and Shell. We have these rogues that are, are, are here busy, busy with Guyana. And what, this, what tends to happen is that the governments tend to then become cheerleaders. You know, they, they, they cheerlead, they waive um, environmental assessments, they don't consult with the people. It's just like um, open road, um, free zone, you guys do what you do, and the protection that we people feel that we need just goes out of the window. So I'm a little off target here, but I want to end by saying that um, I also am a bit disgusted at this, at the little incremental something. So I've seen these um, global recipes where they say if you put 0.2% of, of the X economy into the care economy and you put 2 point something percent and it's just crazy. I mean, even um, ILO have said they can grow up to 400 and uh, 20 something jobs in the care economy if everybody invests in the sustainable development goals. Well, I really don't know what that means. Today, when I looked at the population of the world, it was 7.9 7 billion. And the population this morning of women in the world was 3.9 million. I really want to know how 400 and something jobs in the care economy by the um, year 2030 is going to help in any way. It is these little drops in the bucket that I believe just adds insult to injury with the system that we have. Uh, Mr. Trudeau of Canada, he pledged $100 million. I think the only one so far at some big conference the other day that is to invest in the care economy. Okay, well, thank you, Mr. Trudeau, 100 million, I guess, US or Canadian dollars. And yet, uh, virtually the week before, there was a report that in India, there are now 100 million plus women that are the poorest of the poor since the COVID. So this $100 million, so what you're gonna do, give each of those poorest of the poor women in India a dollar, and then you think that's gonna help the world, to me, the whole thing is absurd. And until we find the mechanisms where the rich of the world are seriously going to invest the billions and the trillions of dollars, as I, as I said in my, in my presentation, that have been lost, billions and trillions, come on, they have to match that to, get, to even get a semblance <laughs> of equality and, um, and reparation, if you like, um, recompense back in the world. So um, I show, I'm just tired with all these little small potatoes, small change kind of recipes that are doled out. It's not going to work. It's going to just keep us where we are. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vanda. Um, yeah, thank you to everyone. I think one key lesson from all of the speakers seems to be the importance of UNCTAD having a broad scope when it comes to gender and development and not being limited to a narrow agenda around the economic inclusion of women. So this includes questions of trade, finance, tax, debt, the climate and more, all of which constitute deep power imbalances in the global political economy that really need to be addressed if we want to create a world with prosperity for all. So thank you again to all of our panelists for their presentations. When we come back, we'll open the floor to your questions.